Hey guys, before uh, we start this episode of Revenge of the Sequel, we just want to point your direction to our website, revengeofthesequel.com. John, do you ever want to keep up with the sequel news? All the fucking time. Comic-Con just happened. Yeah, exactly. I We haven't even talked about all the shit from Comic-Con. Mm-hmm. You know where you can find that news, though? Where? At that fucking website, revengeofthesequel.com. Oh, man. We've got uh, uh, reviews there for new sequels uh, and, o- and old sequels. Um, we, we keep you up to date for new sequels. There, we have a big Comic Con special on there right now, where you can see all of the, the what Justice League. Yeah, the Justice League at stuff. Um, that um, Avengers Infinity War Avengers description. Infinity War, yeah. yeah, exactly. We've all got that stuff. We've got the video of Halle Berry chugging a, a, a bourbon whiskey. Yeah, a whiskey. Yeah, man, she needs a new liver. Like definitely after uh, that. Yeah. Man, it, peer pressure, huh? You, yeah. you could never be too rich or famous. Yeah, she probably had her liver and stomach pumped right after that. Anyway, show. John, John, chug this, chug this real quick. Go to the website. But their story didn't end there. How could there have been only one? And he's back in business. It is the worst idea in the history of bad ideas. Part two is the final chapter in the violent history of... This time, it's personal. May I help you? We'll be asking the questions, old man. Who are you? You. No, not me, you. Yes, I am you. Just answer the damn questions. Who are you? I have told you. Are you deaf? No, you is blind. I'm not blind, you blind. That is what I just said. You just said what? I did not say what. I said you. That's what I'm asking you. And you is answering. Shut up. You. Yes? Not you, him. What's your name? Me. Yes, you. I am me. He's me. And I'm you. And I'm about to whoop your old ass, man, because I'm sick of playing games. You, me. Everybody's ass around here. Him? Kaja, Kaja. I'm gonna kick his ass. I'm ticking it. Kaja, let me Lee, no, Lee, no. Kaja. And that that is probably the <laughs> <laughs> that's that probably describes this movie perfectly. That that what you just Full heard. Full of scenes like that. Yeah. Like just Talking to you. Yeah. Um, welcome to Revenge of the Sequel, episode ninety seven. Ninety seven. Three away. Three away Three from away. the big one hundred. Uh, I'm your host, Emmanuel. I'm your other host, John. And it's just us two right now. Just us two. Two is two the loneliest, loneliest number. number. Oh, that's sad. Two is the loneliest. It's interesting because this is actually the perfect movie for us to watch because here we are. We're two different races. <laughs> two different cultures. <laughs> two, yeah, exactly. Two different personalities. Yeah. Oh, we we take, similar, we take this too far sometimes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just like this movie. How, um, th- we're, we're, t- we're talking about Rush Hour 3. The last Rush Hour film. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. This movie came out oh, in, seven. in 2007. Um, but uh, yeah. Th- th- so we're talking about Rush Hour 3 this week. Mm. And uh, we're going to dive in. We're going to talk about some behind the scenes stuff. We're going to talk about uh, what we thought of the movie and whether or not this sequel um, honestly should have been made. But here is a synopsis mm. really quick. After an, at- an attempted assassination on, amba- on Ambassador Han. Han Lee and Carter head to Paris to protect a French... Okay, I'm going to start over. I always Carter. have a hard time with these things. Yeah. And, there, and it's one sentence. Here we go. After an attempted assassination on Ambassador Han, Lee and Carter head to Paris to protect a French woman with knowledge of the triad's secret leaders. <clears throat> yes, I did it. Mm-hmm. I don't like this synopsis, to protect a French woman. It's very, like, very vague, actually. <laughs> yeah. Hey, they're just going over to protect this French person. So this is a movie... Um, Kind of in the vein of like you know Lethal Weapon, where it's kind of like a buddy cop film, uh, Forty Eight Hours, and you know movies like that, where you kind of have like you know a very uh, you know you you basically have two different cops. Yeah, they're both from d- opposite sides of the track. Yeah, and then they're they're searching for um, you know a murderer or someone or like you know some sort of terrorist, and yeah, hijinks in, yeah. ensues. Did you like the other Rush Hour films? So Rush Hour as a franchise, really crazy. Mm-hmm. Really successful, yeah. Honestly, right up until now. I mean, up until the movie we're talking about. The first Rush Hour, when I watched it, I thought this is genius. Here you have, and I think for studios, they're like, man, we are geniuses. We have Jackie Chan, like global superstar Jackie Chan. We've got Chris Tucker, who has a huge following in the you know the comedy world um, at the time, <laughs> and they thought, let's put them both together. Brett Ratner, uh, the director, and yeah. the move. I think the move first movie worked really well. Like it was. Very much like a uh, fish out of water for Jackie Chan. Right. 
and um and and it had all of the cool stuff like his the fight scenes were really fresh and new yeah and the comedy was really awesome and fresh and it was like set in was... la mm-hmm. where there's definitely like landmarks that you can see and yeah and it was it was really cool I, I really liked it and it was interesting because it kind of exposed a lot of um the moviegoers to different cultures and like you know um, in a way, it could be like, you know, globalism or some sort of, you know, the right. world's getting smaller. We're all learning about each other's, you know, uh, traditions and stuff like that. <laughs> maybe a reach. <laughs> that may be, yeah, that may be a reach. I likened it to like actually just the second coming of the Lethal Weapon franchise. Yeah, which that's is true. like, you know, the Lethal Weapon franchise, in my opinion. I mean, there's there's been, um, you know, buddy cop movies here and there. I think I mentioned them already. It's like 48 Hours and the other yeah. ones. Um, but like Lethal Weapon was really like the staple of like, you know, when you think of buddy cop movies, it's just those two movies or those four movies, I guess now. Yeah. And, um, so rush hour came on the scene when I was like, you know, around eight years old and stuff. And then, uh, watching it actually around that age, I thought it was like the funniest thing ever. Like, yeah. It was just, it's hilarious. Like Chris Tucker is great. His banter with Jackie Chan is amazing. Um, and, and something that was really interesting is because it was very much a comedy as well. Right. They in, they integrated a lot of the comedy into the fight sequences yeah, for Jackie yeah. Chan because Jackie Chan already kind of does that in a way, kinda, not in a Charlie Chaplin way, maybe a, uh, but uh, but yeah, you know, in no, no, kind of no, that bus, Buster Char- Keaton kind of Charlie. I mean Charlie true. Chaplin because like it's all physical, like you know, like so yeah. he, he does like these very action, you know, heavy action martial arts sequences. With a bit of a joke on the yeah. side, whether it's like a prop that he didn't think he could use to fight, like a vase. Yeah, like, I think there's one where he tries to save this really old uh, Chinese vase. Yeah, and he can't break it, so he's fighting with it, like you're trying to juggle it, making like those are really new and cool ways to incorporate what could have been just like a straight action right sequence. And Jackie Chen is like great at this. He's legendary for the team of stunts, stunt right. people I that agree, he works yeah. with. And how they plan everything out, and how it's act- its him. Like he's probably broken bones and <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. Stuff, he's but a it- perfectionist. I think that's what a lot of the what Brett Ratner was thinking. Like Brett Ratner is probably. Uh, I think he, I read that he was a huge fan of Jackie Chan whenever he uh, wanted to make Rush Hour, yeah. and so he like you know cast Jackie Chan, and he actually intentionally reused some of the gags, some of the visual gags from his movies, in Rush Hour in the Rush Hour series. Mind you, they're not done as well as they are in the original movie. Yeah. But, you know, he reuses them and homages them kind of well to, like, you know, just to let you know that, like, you know, he's a fan of Jackie Chan and he likes the yeah. way, the style that... Well, the cool know, thing about Jackie, it. the reason why he's a global superstar is because the martial arts he practices, it, it transcends, like, like a language. Like, yeah. you could watch a Jackie Chan movie and not know, uh, and be looking at subtitles or not be not knowing Chinese and still being really heavily entertained by the stuff that he did. Mm-hmm. Um, let's talk about Brett Ratner for a little bit. So Brett Ratner made a lot of music videos initially and uh, made a short film. Then his debut was a movie called Money Talks in 1997, starring Chris Tucker, Chris Tucker mm-hmm. and Charlie Sheen. So that's, I think, why he, um, he melded really well with Chris Tucker and his style. And then Rush Hour, and we, we think of this like because uh, as being so long ago, because it's almost been, geez, 20 years already. It's already been a long time. Almost, yeah. Uh, it's almost 20 years old, but Rush Hour is really his break into this big blockbuster action scene because Brett mm-hmm. Ratner ends up making, he makes an X-Men movie. He makes he makes a lot of big movies afterwards. That's true. Yeah, he made a, a Hannibal movie. He made a Red Dragon. Yeah. He made, um, yeah. Yeah, he made tons of shit. I mean, he's, yeah. I don't know if he's still making stuff now, but like, you know, he's, um, you know, he's a really popular, like, you know, um, director back yeah. in the day heavily influenced i think by uh sort of the the martial arts films and, and things like that mm-hmm. um and uh, uh the cool thing i think i think why brett ratner is still i still consider him a very talented director is he gets like better uh, for all the things we're about to talk about in um uh rush hour three there are certain parts of this movie that are better than rush hour the original, and I'm talking right. strictly like visual effects, maybe. Oh yeah, yeah, um, and, and and just the way that the cinematography is really pretty to look at. This movie, and that comes with the experience of however long he's been doing it. But mm-hmm. so Rush Hour comes out in 1998. Um, Rush Hour two comes out in 2001, and Rush Hour three comes out in 2007. That's a good. That's a cool like six year wait in between Rush Hour two and Rush Hour three. Um, right. But at this point, though, like, you know, we do got to say, like, I, I went to go see this flick in theaters. Oh, wow. Rush Hour 3? Mm, yes, I did. Cool. I, I, <laughs> I remember vividly what happened. I was very mad at my friend for actually dragging us to this movie afterwards 
but only because like it was kind of weird because like you know there wasn't much of a build up to Rush Hour Three from what I remember. Yeah, um, I know it Rush Hour just, Two might have died actually. Might have died down. Like, yeah, yeah, the definitely. opposite. Because Rush Hour Two is like you know Rush Hour One was this big surprise. Like you know you didn't really get you didn't think it was gonna be that good or just even that great or funny in general. And so when Rush Hour Two came out, like I I remember them promoting Rush Hour Two like a lot. Like you know. Like, it was an event film almost. Yeah. Rush Hour 3 kind of just, like, was kind of... You didn't even like, know they were making it. Yeah, yeah, somewhat. exactly. It's, it's kind of when you hear about a new, like, you know, Insidious flick or something. You're just kind of like, oh, wow, that's coming out? Oh, awesome. Don't drag Insidious into this. Oh, sorry. But, uh, oh, I have to. Like, just Insidious 3. Was Side note, yeah. Exact All, right. Same, All right, like, fine. You get that. But, um, yeah, like, you know, you didn't know they were making it. And then, like, you know, all of a sudden a trailer comes out, like, Rush Hour 3? Like, really? Yeah. And six, the last time you saw, like, you know, Jackie Chan was... For American audiences, anyway, was probably in Rush Hour yeah. too. Well, like, and well the same thing so goes for you're right. Like Tucker. six years is a long time for to be waiting for a movie. Like if you want to strike when the iron's hot when you're making sequels, and I feel like we're going to talk about sequels in larger in a little bit here. Right, but, right. But yeah, I, I think that definitely plays a part into maybe why they lost their touch mm-hmm. in in this movie. But let's talk about. It. So what are your what are your opinions? What did you think? Our our uh, I guess uh, mm-hmm. we could say it's a spoiler for your v- review, but yeah, what what are I mean, your this movie's like a <laughs> really old this movie's like yeah, like but what are your what were your first opinions of this film, Rush Hour Three? First opinions of Rush Hour Three back in like oh seven, I did not like it. I remember my friend of mine who I went with, um, he had a hell of a time. He was laughing. He was probably the only one laughing in the theater. Wow. Uh. I didn't like it coming out of it. Like, you know, just watching it. Even recently, like, um, watching it for this podcast, I mean, there were some moments that I, I chuckled at and, like, you know, I was like, yeah, that's really funny. And there were some really cool uh, visual moments, I guess. Like, even, like, action moments, I guess, sort of. Like, only moments, though. Like, there weren't whole sequences like yeah. the way Rush Hour 2 was. Yeah, um, yeah I don't know. It's, <sighs> just, it's kind of like it. This is one of the examples, and I feel like this is a, a good... Uh, a good thing to talk about here on the podcast because this is probably one of the perfect examples of of franchises going stale, and um, yeah, literally just trying to milk the franchise for what it's worth. Yeah, I agree. When I think of Rush Hour, I think of um, what we talked about earlier: really great action mm-hmm. and the comedy, like you know, really good comedy. Right. Yeah. Um, and I, I felt like I didn't get either. What I mm-hmm. saw was like action mm-hmm. that I don't know if it's maybe Jackie Chan getting a little older six years older almost a decade older right yeah and um same thing goes for tucker tucker like hadn't been on screen since rush yeah, hour two is the only things he's done right and then yeah. it, and then that's the same thing like the jokes um sort of didn't land and it's hard to say because we like to make movies too so right we know how hard it is to make a movie in general so it's kind of hard to talk bad about any movie because like man no one really wants to try to make a bad movie but you did get that sense that it, this was like a cash grab yeah movie. definitely yeah like everyone everyone involved felt like they were doing it yeah. for the paycheck like literally and there are things in it like uh when we when we talk about action i think of like jackie chen i keep saying like I have, i'm trying to stop saying that you say chen too which is jackie like, chan <laughs> uh j- like i'm just kidding no so jackie chan i think of him as being like this great um uh, uh action star who does his own stunts and the best way to see that is maybe doing it in one shot or doing it in one sweeping shot or just mm-hmm. a couple of cuts. But this movie introduced us to so many different cuts where you you didn't get that part of a- yeah. Jackie Chan. He's, like He's just a regular action guy. And there's now. so like many effects, not... like guns blazing. And you're right. It was just like a, a regular Yeah, exactly. It's like guy. someone, if, if you were to cut together, not not... No offense to Tom Cruise. Yeah. Tom Cruise is an awesome person. Yeah. But it's almost like, you know. Open invite Tom Cruise. We're, <laughs> we're Scientologists. It's almost like <laughs> like cutting together a Tom Cruise flick. Like, you know, you, I, I, I have no doubt that Cruise can do that in real life, but it's probably not a one shot take. Like, yeah. you know, it's just, it's obviously like edited together. Yeah. Because his and, action is different. Yeah. And, but Jackie Chan's like, that's what he's known for. His like signature unique, thing. Yeah, exactly. His yeah. signature thing is like those one takes where it looks impossible, but it, like, you know, it took There's, him a thousand takes there, to get yeah, to that point. Yeah, there are stories of Jackie Chan... Um, taking like two or three hundred takes yeah, just to get that, just yeah. to make sure it all worked out because it was like a silent film, you know, shoot it in, in wide. Yeah, and then the, he has no um, budget restrictions in yeah. Hong Kong. Yeah, but here in the states, you know, when they shoot like movies like Rush Hour, we're starring Jackie yeah. Chan. Yeah, they can't just spend like you know money and but money it's, like it's, days on on one shot. It's like they decided to turn the dial and focus a lot on the other kinds of effects. Like, there's so many things that explode. I said like again, damn it. But there's explosions in this movie, a lot of them. A ton of explosions, 
that they decided to focus a lot on. Mm-hmm. Um, and on the other side, Chris Tucker seemed to, I don't know if it's, his, it's maybe the timing's off or the writing's off, but a lot of the jokes that he makes just made me either cringe or just feel really embarrassed in a way. But it, it, it's, yeah. it's what people... I think that's everybody who saw this movie well, probably felt the same way. A lot of the jokes in this movie were very um, political <laughs> and um, and and. Just oddly, out there, like outdated almost, but like not outdated, but like very, I don't know, what am I, I, I think I feel like you're, I, you're onto something. Like it, it feels exaggerated to the point where you're just like, yeah. oh, really? Like, it's, it's this, these were South Park jokes. Yeah. But this wasn't South Park. This yeah. was an action movie starring Jackie Chan and Chris Tucker. Like these jokes. Example number one, which is when he first, when the yeah. commissioner first says, um, so what about last week when you arrested six so those Iranians? Six Syrians, they're Syrians. Oh, Syrians, they're same Iranians. thing. Am I right? Oh. No. Oh, God <laughs> yeah, no. Here we are. Chris Tucker's here. No, but yeah, yeah. They they arrested six Syrians who are doctors or something like that, right? Yeah, and he was like, that doesn't mean they're not going to blow shit up. And, and I, was I was like, like what? <laughs> yeah, exactly. If th- these jokes, I I don't know, and I feel like we didn't see that, or maybe we saw a very toned down version of that, or maybe I'm not sure. Maybe the times changed or something. Because I was I like, think so yeah, well, because this was post nine eleven. Right. Well, the thing is, like, I feel like these jokes are probably present in Rush Hour 2 or 1. I don't know if we minded back then, but I haven't seen those yeah. two movies in a long time. Well, one of the biggest but, like, parts of it is those movies were set in the United States. Yeah. Where, you know, that was okay to make those patriotic jokes. But this movie is in a post-9-11 set, world. Post-9-11 world. Like, yeah. In a different country. Yeah. Where you, uh, one of the most famous scenes of this movie is the taxi cab scene where he pulls a gun out on a taxi cab driver and forces him to sing. Oh, the the the, the anthem. National anthem, and that wasn't funny. Did you think that was funny? No, I was like, all. what? Is, this is a horror movie. I'm laughing at the fact that we don't think it's funny now, but like, it's insane. Yeah, it's it's terrible. It's like, bonkers, and it was written as a joke. <laughs> lots of like lots of jokes like that in this movie got me that way. Like it's yeah. just we we're. I don't know if we should talk about it now or just. We'll, we'll talk about it, but, but okay, yeah, cool. th- this movie was was that for me. It was not. Uh, it was not rush or hour. It was an hour. It was a <laughs> it definitely was rushed. An, it was definitely rushed. It was, maybe it was a rushed hour, but must much like actual rush hour, it uh, sucks. Yeah. <laughs> but cool. I'm gonna turn the cameras off, and then we'll go into a little bit deeper our feelings of rush hour three. Did this have a subtitle? No. No. It's just rush hour three. three. Yeah. Paris style. Yeah. <laughs> I like watching. God damn it! I feel like Chris Tucker shouldn't listen to this podcast. I like watching the covers of the Rush Hour flicks because you see yeah. like Chris Tucker get yeah, get, you know, noticeably fatter each. Um, oh boy! Well, let's talk. Let's talk <laughs> each, about each cover. Um, uh, let's talk about him. Um, Chris Tucker. I heard. Did you hear this? This welcome back to our gossip corner. Okay. We turn the cameras off. We're drinking our wines. <laughs> um, I heard Chris Tucker would not come back to the movie. Unless he first got twenty million dollars, and got top billing over Jackie Chan. I think you're right about that. Actually. And because of that, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm not one to confirm. Well, does not work? <laughs> like, I think that's industry. just like he assumes he's the reason why these movies did well. And because of that, maybe that's why we noticed him more in this movie. Is maybe he's actually in this movie more. Like I oh. think, like I think the jokes. <clears throat> damn, I keep saying like I think that his jokes are more noticeable. Because there's more of them because he was the he's the top billed actor in this. So you, yeah, and this is the first of the series where he's he has built above he's a bit built above Jackie Chan. Jackie Chan. Well, I believe that's true. Um, I read an interview when they hadn't made a Rush Hour three yet, but I remember reading an interview back in the day when they when Jackie Chan was saying like you know Chris Tucker only does two movies and he wants like you know millions of dollars to do this role like you know he's yeah. He thinks he's big, but he's not big. This is Jackie Chan, mind you, saying this. Yeah, and Jackie Chan, super humble dude. Like, he's yeah, not yeah, a, exactly. Yeah, he's not and a wild like, guy. Yeah, he wouldn't like, and he's not really necessarily saying anything bad about Chris Tucker. He's just literally saying how it is. Like, he's like, oh, we are not making a third one because Chris Tucker wants more money. And so, like, I get that because Chris Tucker has only been on screen um, a couple of times throughout the years. Yeah. Like, well, he was in what that last Ang Lee movie, uh, Billy Lynn's Long Halftime Walk, or yeah. something. He's he in, a in a Silver Linings Playbook. Silver Linings Playbook before that. I think before that was like was Rush Hour 3. Yeah. So like, you know, yeah, that 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 makes total sense to me. I mean, he's the reason um he's the reason uh Ice Cube can get, you know, that character back to Friday. You know how how Chris Tucker was in the yeah, first Friday, Friday yeah. movie? Mm-hmm. Um yeah, like um 
Ice Cube says, I can't afford to pay Chris Tucker for another yeah. Friday movie because like he went off and did the Rush Hour movies and his fee is too high. Yeah. Well, it, and it's interesting how those movies have, and you know what else is interesting is like he's, he gave, he got top billing. Like Jackie Chan was like, give him. Yeah. And Jackie Chan probably didn't care. Billing. He's yeah. just like, whatever. But um, yeah, so that's, I, that may go hand in hand with what we're talking about, of the, the comedy in this movie. Mm-hmm. They maybe didn't, they probably let him do a lot of whatever he wanted to do. Oh yeah. And they probably did like a lot of improv too. Cause if you watch the bloopers too, like of all the movies, like he's getting lines wrong and they, at one point, they're just like, "Let's just do it like that." And I read a like, review that said the w- the bloopers are more entertaining than oh, than yeah, this movie in definitely. general. Um, let's talk about this greater thing that this movie does. We talked about the settings early on, but um, I think we're going to end up talking about a lot of the maybe the tropes of these sequel movies, and this is just our case study for it. But what do you think about sequels? Deciding w- when we want to do something new, we're just going to set it in a in different, a different city. place because yeah. this is set in Paris. And I think they're thinking the interesting settings and the new places will be enough to can make this movie a different movie. And we see this a lot uh, when uh, well, the White White House Down or whatever they've made a uh, London Has Fallen, mm-hmm. the exact same movie. White House Down. It's a different uh, movie. It's a uh, what is Olympus it? Has fallen. Olympus Has Fallen. Yeah, <laughs> and you know, same movie. Almost set the exact same movie. Just in three a different, different movies. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it, it's. Um, what do you think about that whole idea? Does it work, or are there I big think, problems? I don't, I don't know. Like, it's that's a wild card because like it it works sometimes and it doesn't work like yeah. most of the times. Yeah, I'm trying to think of a of a of a, re, of a way where it does work. Short of like a of a I, I galaxy the, movie like Star Indiana, Trek, Star Wars, or obviously. the Indiana Jones movies, that's true, like, yeah. where that where the the setting changes and it's just, like that's yeah. the I think the main example. That's I guess. good. Yeah, that's a good example. Um, the you know like Temple of Doom works uh, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, uh, Cru- Last Crusade works yeah. because they're all just like different, like you know, adventures and stuff. Yeah. I think that's where it, it kind of takes, you know, yeah, that that's where the trope comes from. Like you know, you have Romancing the Stone, and then you have Jewel of the Nile, which yeah. is like you know, same movie, just two different locations. Yeah, uh, in this case, you know, Rush Hour one, two, and three, just set in different yeah. cities all and over a, the world. In a more current version, um, watch any of the um, Fast and Furious movies; they're set in ridiculous, you know, yeah. crazy places for. Really, no reason yeah, exactly. whatsoever, and it's all like just to like you know just drive cars fast, like you yeah. know drive cars in New York, drive cars Boom. in Dubai, drive Boom. cars in Antarctica, I guess, yeah. like the last one. Um, yeah, I guess that's where like you know it changing the setting, I guess, can make your movie really awesome, but most of the time it doesn't. It, it you have to really like you know have purpose behind yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, have purpose and just embrace like yeah. what your story is, uh, at least according to the setting. And we're, so. I mean, we're obviously not. Um, like we we understand we're pretty logical. We know that sometimes it's a money thing. Oh, when yeah, Transformers definitely. shoots in China, it's for the Chinese for the audience incent- box office yeah, or, or incentives. Incentive. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's yeah. a huge part of it. And um, but mm-hmm. there are examples where the incentives work, but also either visually or in the story or you, that setting is so good and it comes to life. Example: uh, uh, one of the James Bond movies recently shot in Mexico. The Spectre. Yeah. Spectre, and they got a huge, huge amount of money for Mexico to shoot there, but it worked. Like you know, it was a great opening scene. Sequence, yeah, exactly. Like as, as I think, as long as you you make the um, the setting flow well on 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 screen, yeah. like you, you're you're probably okay. It's golden, yeah. yeah, exactly. But this movie takes that to a new level, and it's it's something else to be in another country, but it's totally different to be in another country, and then totally disrespect that country oh yeah, yeah this movie totally disrespects paris french the people fr- yeah exactly. even from the second they land um uh they get uh first of all they get reprimanded and held by roman polanski by roman by, polanski of all people uh roman who, polanski. who was a fan of the rush hour franchise and that's why he's he in this asked movie to be in, in this movie yeah. that's bonkers um but he is he anally probes them right as an airport security oh, yeah, guy? He anally probes. Them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He, yeah, he, he um, gives them their cavity check. He beats them up. Yeah, with phone books and stuff. Which is there's insane. another racist. Uh, I don't know if it's racist or not, but there's a Chinese like joke later on uh, related yeah. to the phone book. They're just like, "You're looking. We're not in China. Oh, phone book yeah. twice as big." Oh my gosh! But it's 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 bonkers what they do. Because if you brought up that little tinge of racism, but this movie for a PG thirteen movie. And that's maybe one of my biggest problems too. Is um, I think during this during this time, two thousand seven, movies were slowly being more okay with the rated R action movies. At least mm-hmm. they were like, "Hey, if we're gonna make an action movie, let's do a like just all out." Mm-hmm. And this movie's PG thirteen, so the action gets you to a point and then mm. cuts yeah. you off. 
Um, but uh, the conversations that are risque in this one, though. Yeah, but yeah. everything else is ris- like the uh, the things they say. Oh, I can't even begin to talk about the nun scene. <laughs> oh, the <laughs> nun scene. Play by. Hold on. I have the actress's name, who's um, from Home Alone Two. That's who I recognize her from. But this Dana, so Dana. Hold on. Hold on. Dana Ivy. Yeah, who plays this? This this plays the nun. Yeah. yeah, this this old nun who has to translate between a French, um, uh, French member of the yakuza. Yeah, who, uh, and there's some racist tones before that. Yeah, They're like, "You're cr- French. You're you're Asian. Stop Speak embarrassing English. yourself." Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh God, that, all the racist things Chris Tucker says. <laughs> so, don't. I, this is not stuff that Jackie Chan says yeah. in the movie. This it almost w- looks like he's ashamed. He's like, "Oh God." Was this back when racism was comedy? Like, and <sighs> not <laughs> in this day and age. Yeah, I don't even know what cues they were coming off <laughs> of. What sort of cultural cues they looked at and and. Thought well, let's do that, but worse. <laughs> oh wow! But uh, but yeah, that nun scene is insane. There, he's like, oh, mm. she's he, he said the n word. Well, tell him whore. And then I think the joke was, oh, it starts with a w. It's not an h word. Oh or, yeah, yeah. Uh, but man, there's there's so many of those kinds of sequences in this mi- film that make you question why they didn't just go with a hard R. Because yeah. here you are m- having these conversations that are probably more damaging to young kids. <laughs> More so than showing someone getting their head, you know, chopped off or something like that. But I don't know. Bonkers decision making in this rush hour mm-hmm. movie. Insane decision making. So that's one of the tropes we're talking about. Settings. Um let's go back to that action thing, the violence thing. Um what it'd be interesting to see the movies um that came out in two thousand seven, especially action movies. Spider Man three was probably one of them. Yeah. The Born Ultimatum came Born out. Born Ultimatum. Shooter, Hot Fuzz. Live Free or Die Hard, Death Proof, Hitman, Shoot 'Em Up, um, Grindhouse, Plant Terror, Ghost Rider. These are like, the Kingdom. These are all movies. Three Ten to Yuma. Sorry, I keep going. Twenty Eight Weeks. These are movies that are <laughs> hard R. A lot of these movies are hard R, super violent movies that did well for the period, because from nineteen ninety eight to two thousand seven, almost in that decade, people became more and more okay with not just violence, but they were you know it was okay. It wasn't yeah. it wasn't bad. So uh, maybe this is kind of one of those escape from L.A. type things that we talked about where they waited too long for the sequel. Because if this movie had come out closer to the, uh, the, I guess the original one, two, like in, in 04 or something, it might have yeah. had a it might have worked impact, yeah. better. You're right. Because it's I bet if we went to 1998 and looked at action movies, there would be very few that were close to rush hour. Right, yeah. You know, in tone. Or oh, anything. yeah, definitely. I mean, I think it, it did come a little too. I think it's the reason, like, you know, like what we said earlier, like it wasn't really promoted as much. It you ki- it kind of came out of nowhere. Yeah. Like, you know, and the fact that you hadn't really seen the two leads since Rush Hour yeah. 2, you're kind of just like, oh, well, this, what else could they be doing? And it's weird because they, uh, the production team had talked about shooting back-to-back sequels. So they were going to shoot Rush Hour 3 and, and 4, 4 yeah. at the same time to save money. And my gosh, I'm kind of happy that they did. That they did not, yeah. All of the what we're talking about is is insane, but this movie did not do bad at the box office. Oh no, no. Rush Hour Three was bad, but it made a lot of money. It made a lot of money, but I know it didn't make as much money as the second one. Yeah, that's the thing is like, we're, that's the reason we don't have a Rush Hour Four. Yeah, like it's just because like you know, because it's er, what it's already ten years later and we don't have a fourth one. They're still talking about it, like yeah. you know, quote unquote. Um, but like you know, uh. It didn't obviously like something scared people off of this one. I don't know if it was franchise fatigue or if it was just a bad movie. Yeah, like, you know, it's just or both. Yeah. So, but yeah, like I, I just feel like if if it would have made more money, we would have had another one, re- or at least like a, a reboot by this point, which we kind of did in a television series mm. uh, form a couple of months ago. Cool. But yeah, it, uh, even that got canceled. Yeah. So <laughs> shit. Well, this movie is. I mean, we can talk about franchise mm. fatigue, but this movie really does rehash a lot of. The first two Rush Hour. Yeah. You're talking about how a lot of the characters from Rush Hour and Rush Hour Two are in this movie mm-hmm. as critical, it's especially the first one. Like it, it has a big uh, nostalgic trip for the first one. You have characters like the console, like you know Ambassador Han, who was the console Han in the first yeah. one, played lo- by the same actor. You know the ambassador looks a lot like the actual president mm-hmm. of China right now. Really? Side note, yeah, I was like, man, he looks exactly no, he like <laughs> even beyond <laughs> him being Asian, he looks a lot like. <laughs> um, who the guy who, who, who uh, the, the yeah the actual president? No, oh, great. <laughs> so um yeah so he's back. Um you don't have the same actress playing Sue Young who's the the daughter yeah as the first one, but you do have that character come back. Um you have impressive fucking like you know Academy Award winning actors and actresses like uh not actresses but like 
Um, the guy who played the bad guy was Max von Sydow. Yeah, like he's fucking the fucking the dude from Ingmar Bergman's films. Yeah, like he's fucking crazy. He's like, a legend. You know, he's yeah, a, exactly. He's a legend, an of acting movies. legend. Uh, you have Roman Polanski, who's like, uh, yeah, he's um, he's a directing legend. Uh, yeah. I don't know about a very good person. Infamous. Yeah, infamous person. He, he's close to infamy now. Infamous person, good director. <laughs> there infamous you go. person. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, they were able to draw a lot of good. People well, Brett Ratner is is he's sort of one of these people. He's like who, a frat boy director, though. Like, yeah, I mean, you can totally tell just by watching his movies. Like, I don't know. I I saw an interview with Brett Ratner on Attack of the Show where he lied about banging Olivia Munn. Wow, and it was just it was appalling. It was just like, why would you do that? And he was just like, oh, I just want to say that because she's hot and God. it was fun. Like I was on the camera, and I'm like, oh, dude, you're such a douche. Well, like, he's. He's sort of um, really successful in the Hollywood sphere, like even with TV he's producing. A he's a very good commercial director. Yeah, like, people. Yeah, like, yeah, he's powerful. Yeah, like he's up there. I don't know about now, but like he was, like at least in this era of the, because like, he was getting projects. He got like you know what? Um, they offered him the the Superman reboot before it yeah. was even rebooted. Like you know, the they Superman gave Flyboy. him X that last X or yeah, what they thought was going to be one of the X-Men last X Men. The X-Men. last stand. Yeah, and yeah. They gave him a. Red Dragon, you know the fucking um, Hannibal Lecter third film. Yeah, uh, they gave him Hercules. That was his like last big flick, Hercules and Tower Heist. Yeah, and so like you know he's a very good like Hollywood commercial director. Yeah, he just you know kind of has trouble sticking the landing on his actual yeah. films. I think he is a very successful producer. I think I think he he can manage a very large group of of stuff. He he produced um I think he he produced the Revenant. You know he's he's got an eye for Rat for Pack th- Entertainment. Rat yeah. Pack Entertainment. Rat is, Pack is, is huge. It's his it's his company. Yeah. yeah, they they make a lot of movies um that um do well and a lot of movies that that don't like um yeah. So that's Brett Ratner for you. Am I right? Mm-hmm. Open invite Brett Ratner. Hey we're there, sci- Ratner. We're we're Scientologist. Um <laughs> I don't know if he's Scientologist. I, I don't know. Um let's wouldn't talk. Supr- I wouldn't put it past him. <laughs> yeah. I think I think he could be. Um, uh, what are your? I, I know we talked about kind of about the tone already. Where like uh, we wanted kind of the balance between action and comedy, and this one had maybe too much comedy and and, and less action. Mm-hmm. But um, I I one of the the scenes that I remember, and we talked about it before we started podcasting, is um, sort of the early third act when they have a fight because uh, he's like, "You're not my brother, and uh, I'm your brother." God damn it! And this. Uh, overtly racist montage montage yeah. is happening where Jackie Chan is watching like uh, uh, Africans <laughs> on TV and oh orders God. fried chicken missing Chris Tucker's character and Chris Tucker is watching short round <laughs> in Indiana from Indiana Jones, Jones yeah. and he or- he's ordering Chinese food yeah and he's smiling at the at the TV yeah. set the entire time and it's supposed to be them like you know missing each other missing each other it is very, very like yeah, and it, I, very racist. And it's not that these things are, or I maybe, think, intentional. I and, and is I, it racist or not? Like maybe that's just, that's the stereotype of those characters. Yeah, but even then, like I guess that stereotype is very, very racist. But there's a way to do it. Like uh, if you watch um, Harold and Kumar, there's a lot of crazy racial oh, yeah, tones yeah, so, or yeah. things that they that they uh, focus on. But I don't know. I just feel like they do it better, maybe. Oh, Harold yeah, and Kumar definitely. did it better. Well, because like, they get a laugh out of you. They don't just be like, yeah. they don't get you rolling your eyes. You're just like, oh, shit. Like, yeah. Like, and from watching this. Just to be clear, John and I are not, soup, we're not PC police at all. No, we no, are no. okay with, a, you've listened to earlier podcasts. Yeah, listen to the, the early episodes, guys. We are guilty of some of the crimes that we <laughs> blame other people for committing. So for, for us to be talking about this movie this way, Means that it hammered itself yeah, into us as exactly. a movie that was, I I don't want to say it's just insensitive, but it was just I, I there was no point to the stuff it was mm-hmm. making. Yeah, I, I think of like the campaign, which is a movie with Will Ferrell, and Zach Galifianakis, and they were playing these over the top kind of satirical, um, you know, politicians who said racist things, and that was supposed to be kind of like be a comment on how. But this movie, Rush Hour Three, I don't know what it was doing. It, yeah, it takes you other than trying to make you laugh from the stuff. From just they were like saying. very, very yeah. lazy stereotype. Yeah, and so it's it's really it's really weird. You, it, it's not that you don't laugh at it. I laugh at the the effort. Yeah, or at least maybe just like the maybe in this case the pathetic effort yeah. to like yeah. make you laugh because it's it's kind of weird. It's like, absolutely unbelievable. Yeah, exactly. is what it is. Like it there the opening is Chris Tucker conducting traffic and dancing and causing car wrecks, which I've seen before. Yeah, and he fat shames. 
He, he f- fat shames a chick. <laughs> like, he fat shames a chick and borderline rapes a girl. Like he tells them they can get out of a ticket. If they go out with him, if they like go out with night. him, yeah. And I don't know if it's maybe the way that po- we view police now, but that made me <laughs> uncomfortable. I was like, "Oh, is this what women go through every day?" Yeah, it's so. <laughs> but they didn't do that in in like a in a way. I keep saying like they did that not in a way to comment on it. They did it in a way that this is the character. Yeah, he's a fun guy, which goes back to your thing with Brett Brett Ratner being a frat guy. This is like, like, like uber frat. Yeah, frat exactly. Guy. Like how how is this your idea of a, of a fun guy? Yeah, like in this day and age, this, this is, is not really, fun. Yeah. And you kind of got that Jackie Chan was maybe uncomfortable, or maybe at least his character was, mm-hmm. because he would always be so dismissive of the antics that Chris Tucker wanted to do. Like when he when he said, "Oh, let's date these girls," he was like, "Uh, no, no," like, right. ah, "I'm uncomfortable." And that could be a very honest Jackie Chan. Yeah, definitely. being like, "These are weird." Weird yeah. scenarios we find ourselves in. Although I do feel like in this movie it was a little normalized, though, just for the third time around, yeah. like for Jackie Chan, because like he was kind of yeah. getting into it at one point too, which there, is kind of weird. There is there's supposed to be friction in these buddy cop things. There's supposed yeah. to be. It's like a clash of a, yeah, it's a clash of personalities. So like they do things very differently, and you know, they clash them, two times before. Here's, yeah, yeah, exactly. clash. Well, it's also like they. That that's another weird thing. Like I guess I will bring that up right now. They've clashed almost the same way in every movie, so it's kind of like you know you don't have a different, like in this one. Yeah, yeah I guess they they, you have more of an attachment to them because like they've been together longer. But it's still like you know they fight for a scene and then they yeah. they make up the next scene. And I think what gave it a weird context was all the cultural clashing that Chris Tucker was forcing on the surrounding characters. <laughs> yeah. with these little I don't want to say racist, these little weird jokes um but and i think in the original we had the more somewhat of a cultural clash between the two of them which was understandable because they had just met. they had just met and there was also just the clash of how they they did things as policemen mm-hmm. people of law from different places like you know the very, very different way of policing right but in this movie it was just a the i think the what was supposed to be the betrayal was the fact that he had a brother that he didn't kill that Jackie Chan had a brother that he valued more than Chris Tucker. Right, yeah. And that... A Japanese brother. A Japanese brother. Yeah, exactly. Who They grew up in the same orphanage. Uh, gosh. But it was... Uh, it just wasn't... Because I think felt like it was resolved fairly quickly, too. Oh, yeah, definitely. At 30 minutes into it was when they have this big fight. And there's another hour left. So the rest of it was just exposition well the thing is like after they have that fight they make up like fairly quickly like i, I actually don't yeah. remember the scene where they make up but they do they happen to be like, at the same place at the same time yeah yeah exactly and so like it's just like it it there wasn't like a lot of like you know emotional moments being poured out there because it's just undone like the next second yeah so there's a lot of um stake raising i think from this movie um they definitely tried to make it a bigger thing um, but they have not yet gotten to the point where the whole world's going to blow up, which mm-hmm. I appreciate yeah. that a lot of movies do. I was listening to a podcast with Edgar Wright earlier, and he said he noticed um, uh, <laughs> that in a lot of the movies now, and it happens in this movies too, he says there's always a scene where uh, the main actor yells uh, exposition at a wind machine. <laughs> like, you he's like you you have to you have to throw the grenade into the into the portal <laughs> and it's got to blow up and you'll save the planet and he says that he's noticed it more in every movie even in you know wonder woman or really great yeah. marvel dc movies where there's a scene where someone's shouting exposition into a wind oh yeah yeah definitely machine and i didn't even notice that but this I mean, movie has that kind of weird trope too like mm-hmm. you know, you have to do this or th- th- something's going to happen. Right, exactly. And it's just an old school thing. And then, um, side note, uh, Mike Judge said that he noticed that uh, in every police procedural, he thinks when they describe what they're doing, like, we have to test the DNA and find a strand of hair that'll match to our victim. He thinks at the end of it, they should say, or you know this because it's our job. <laughs> He's <laughs> like w- in real life. They shouldn't police be officers. explaining. Yeah. The, to their colleagues. Be, it would be quiet. It would yeah. just be very quiet. So this what are you doing? What I'm doing this. Yeah. My, oh, my, oh, my job. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of, oh, this is the same thing that matched those other yeah, 10 exactly. murders. And <laughs> what am I doing? What does it look like? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Cool. You know, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, you're just an, you're just the <laughs> CSI. You fucked. <laughs> yeah. You fucked the world for this. You fucked the world. <laughs> Anyways. But yeah, I, I think this movie is a great example of. Um, sequels that shouldn't be made and mm-hmm. wait to outstay their welcome. There you go. That's the thing. 
And, you know, I just want to say one thing to one of our listeners here, uh, James Cameron. Uh, you waited too long for Avatar 2. I don't 2, know about 3. Avatar. Ugh. Yeah, exactly. Well, the, no, time will tell because, like, yeah. apparently there's a demand. I mean, I'm not sure how you went to the Avatar land. There and, is a demand. Yeah, exactly. So if there's a demand for that, there may be, there yeah. still may be a demand for movies. That's interesting because I think one of the uh, genres that is immune to this whole thing is uh, sci-fi. sci-fi and horror. Really? Sci-fi and horror. Well, yeah, I guess you're right. I think yeah. are immune, and you can keep rebooting those. There are diminishing returns, but they're, there they're not as much as like yeah. you know these types of movies. Risk where it's is just sm- like, you know, risk is smaller in horror, mm-hmm. definitely. Your budget's lower. Yeah, yeah. but action movies, we have <laughs> so many. I think uh, I don't know if you agree. But short of a few outliers, um, like anything Matthew Vaughn does, short of that, superhero films have sort of filled in that action movie air, space. Does that make sense? Like where where you can have a rush hour and all these other action packed oh, movies yeah, come yeah. out. I get you. So um, they, they've kind of dominated the action. They've dominated genre. the action. Like they're, they're they're the dominant action. Yeah. Subgenre at this point. Yeah. Because like superheroes. People have tried Man from Uncle. Like people have tried making movies. That are solely original action films, or like a spy film, or, or a spy like film, yeah. and um, they they don't do as well as superhero flicks. There's less of those now than there are like three Marvel movies. You're right, exactly. Like, and that's why year. people are probably trying to buy up every comic right that they have. Like, yeah. you know, just like you know, let's have a Bloodshot yeah. movie, which yeah. is a fucking like. It kind of defeats my point that saying that people are more towards rated R action movies, but maybe for some audience it is that because every Marvel movie is a PG thirteen action. Well, the thing is, because you can bring kids to it. Rated R action movies are kind of like weird though, because like you know, rated R, you know, you either you lose a a good amount of audience just right off the bat by just being R immediately. But I think less now than ever before. Mm. Like I, I feel like if if you have like a like a hit like Fury Road, yeah, like just like a hit, yeah. Like man, it doesn't matter if it's R, PG thirteen, or PG. Like people are gonna flock to see that. Yeah. So I think it's less and mm-hmm. less a big deal now. Yeah. And, 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 and to show that, I mean, Logan, I bet you, Logan, I yeah. bet you kids went to Logan. Like oh, I, yeah, definitely. I, yeah. I, the box office shows that there are probably preteens in that movie. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Watching all this. There's probably families just like taking their, uh, like, you know, taking their, their kids, kids to like, Hey, look, I, I grew oh, up with X-Men. Wolverine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> There's a kid in this movie. I'm sure it's okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If that kid got to see it. You can see it. <laughs> um, but yeah, what, yeah, I think, Action movies, even maybe comedic action movies, are on a decline because people would rather see things more on the comedic side <clears throat> that happens to have action in it or just a straight action movie. I don't know. I can't I think f- of the last. <clears throat> I, I, and I feel I, like Guardians of the Galaxy was still that's pretty true. Yeah. like comedically. Like if you. Again, I think it all just. Rep- it's just yeah. It just it depends on if your movie is just like. A, yeah. Like. If at the end of the day, if your movie is powerful, like emotionally wise, and like if it's just good, I don't know how to say good. I don't want to just say good because, like, you know, good means different for everybody else. Yeah. But if your movie is just like, you know, if it works on the emotional level and it's like a satisfying story, then like it's, sh- I mean, you're, it transcends about, your genre. We're talking about like, the Kingsman. Kingsman was great. Like, yeah, it, exactly. It, and that's it, a comedy, that. that's a comedy action yeah, movie. Definitely, yeah. definitely. It's, and a spy flick, too. Yeah. Like, you know, you don't get a lot of spy movies nowadays either. So, yeah. <clears throat> that work well for people. Yeah. So, like, I think it, it really just depends on your. The the I guess this sounds cheesy, but the 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 amount of heart or love that yeah. you put in your movie. What's interesting to me is we look, if we study film and we look back, like you know, to the westerns of the fifties and sixties, we can tell those were the movies of that period. Mm-hmm. But I don't know if it's because we're going older. This podcast has shown me like movies that were movies for those periods, and we were alive during it. You know, mm-hmm. which is yeah. different than looking at like a silent movie and being like, obviously that was a hit. Right. Yeah. But we're, we're <laughs> now of the opera. Who, who, the uh, fuck? who would like, watch yeah, that? Exactly, but we're yeah. now reviewing movies and talking about movies that wouldn't work now, but work then. Yeah. Does that make sense? So it's we're 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 definitely seeing uh, kind of a, a time period and a theme and maybe like a cultural like a shift shift. Almost, yeah. And we're, we're it's easier to draw a line. And know that these are the kinds of movies that happened in the '90s or the early 2000s, and these are the kinds that are happening, happening like right now. Mm, yeah. And it's weird, be- mm. only because we're 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 alive yeah. <laughs> during it. And that's yeah, that's so weird too. But like you know, I don't know. It's just it's kind of weird though, because every now and then you'll get a movie that kind of just transcends yeah. the test of time, just, just changes like it, everything. It literally like can fit every era. And you're just like, wow, those are the ones. Those are the keepers. Like, yeah. You know, whether it be a sequel or any other, like, you know, standalone flick, yeah. it's 
you got to look out for those. Yeah. And this movie is not one of those. No, so. yeah, this is definitely forgettable. Yeah. yeah. I can't imagine how these talks are going for Rush Hour 4 because something definitely needs to change. Not right. just the setting. Yeah. Like, something big has to change. Mm-hmm. Either they're passing this along to a next... A new, yeah, a new generation. A new generation, or... Maybe it's like a family flick or yeah. something. Or maybe they're just old and you do a lot of that stuff. Like, uh, uh, that'd be cool we too. can't fight you know, anymore. You or... do like a... Like, almost like a Las Vegas <laughs> like type of like movie. That's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Even though they're not that old, but like, you yeah. know, I'm just saying, like, you know, you don't do... There's gotta be You don't something. do Lethal Weapon yeah. 4, in other words, because Lethal Weapon 4 is basically Lethal Weapon 3, Yeah, just with a little bit more jokes, and you, you want to avoid, especially if you're going to go on your fourth round, like, you you want to avoid just doing stuff yeah. the exact same way you did before, yeah. so, shit. I do feel like there is a very solid fan base for Rush Hour. I oh, think yeah, definitely. the fact that this movie... I, I'm one of those people. Like, yeah. I, I like Rush Hour. Like, yeah. It's, it's a it's it's a fun franchise. It like, was good. Know. It was new. Mm-hmm. It was so yeah. new. I remember watching it, and I'm watching mm-hmm. it over and over and over again, and being like, "This is pretty cool." Mm-hmm. I think I had a Jackie Chan toy. Um, growing up, from Jackie Chan Adventures. Yeah, that's what I think okay, it's from. Cool. Actually, I was like, I don't think it was a Rush Hour toy. I don't think they made toys. For I was Rush about hour. to say, I was like, no. Yeah, this is from the <laughs> this is from the uh, cartoon. I got a Jackie Chan toy from the cartoon. I was waiting for you to say a Chris Tucker toy. I Interesting was like, That's enough, not you know what Jackie Tucker Chan's toy? highest grossing movie is? Isn't it Rush Hour Two or Rush Hour Three? It's think one of, of them. Yeah. Think of uh, Jackie Chan, his highest grossing Karate Kid, Rush mm-hmm. Hour Two, Karate Kid. No. Rush Hour Two, Rush uh, Hour Three. No. Fuck. Kung Fu Panda. Kung Fu Panda. I forgot about that one. Bonkers, right? Yeah. He's the voice, but Kung Fu Panda 1, 2, and 3 are his, his three highest grossing movies. Guess. Ah, uh, no, never mind. <laughs> Not a big deal. Yeah, those are it. Those Kung are the Kung Fu Panda's a great, a great yeah. franchise. I hope to review some of their sequels and, in the future. And the Rush Hours are right behind it. Yeah. Um, I w- that would make sense. You know what's really weird? Like, after Rush Hour 2 um, came out, I think, like, he went on to do uh, pseudo rush hour movies like Shanghai, Shanghai Noon and yeah. Shanghai Nights. He even did the Tuxedo, which is more of an Americanized, um, like spy flick almost. Yeah, now. just him, you know. Yeah, with Jennifer Love Hewitt. Yeah, mm. I remember mm. that movie. Yeah, it, it, it was really cool. I think I have a toy from that one too. Actually, you have a toy from the Tuxedo. What made me upset is they made it feel, seem like all of his karate was from the suit. I was like, come on, that's Jackie Chan. <laughs> he's he knows <laughs> he knows what he's doing. He's his great at his skin suit. Yeah, <laughs> his skin suit. Other than that tuxedo. Yeah, exactly. But I felt it was cool. I think I'm still happy we watched this movie. Oh yeah, definitely. I think it's a learning uh, experience for everybody who's yeah. actually listening to this. Like you know, this is one of those movies that like yeah does not age well. Yeah. Or one of those sequels that you can totally tell because even the casual audience member, in my opinion, I'm I'm totally confident that you can watch this movie and be like, these people's hearts are not aren't in it. Like yeah. you can even see Chris Tucker like at, at some points not being interested in what the fuck he's saying. Yeah, and so like you know, they're all there for a paycheck. Um, I obviously don't know if that's exactly true, but like yeah. it does look like they're there for a paycheck. Like you know, they're not their gags are uninspired. Their action is subpar to the first two movies. Not much has changed. Yeah, not much. At not all. Just changed. The tropes are recycled. Like, did you notice that every single villain in every Rush Hour movie falls from a high place? Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, they all die from like you know just falling from somewhere, and so like it's. It's not really anything new other than just like, you know, looking at the characters yeah. in an older light. So shit. And and they waited a long, a long time. Long time, yeah. And if you were waiting that long, you would assume, which is we're talking to you, James Cameron. <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah, there you go. But if you're waited if we're to wait a long time, it better be good. Be good. Like, better, better be good. Because you have time. You have time to and you hopefully have gotten better as a filmmaker or as an actor and or as, be, a director, or as a director, or as a director, exactly. But yeah, this movie, Ouch. not a good one. So, final thoughts. What are you? What is your thoughts on? I'm honestly so surprised we talked more mm. than ten minutes on this movie. <laughs> but I think <laughs> what helped here. was was we talked about sequels as a whole, and that <clears throat> yeah, because really, I mean, this could be just us. That this could be a great example of all the things that go wrong yeah. whenever sequels should not have been made. All right. Yeah. This is just one of the probably many examples that will probably. Yeah. Uh, come across in the future. I, I appreciate this movie for um, um, 
No, never mind. I don't. I don't. I don't like this movie. Ouch. Yeah. Uh, and it and it is hard because you know it, uh, a lot of people worked, but it's it's like I don't feel bad saying it's a bad movie because everyone got paid so much fucking money for this movie. Right. Yeah. It, this movie costs more than any other rush. It's it costs a hundred something million. And you wouldn't you wouldn't get you wouldn't guess that from just watching it. Yeah. One hundred forty yeah. million dollars. So everyone and it made the money back. So everyone got rich off of this thing. So I definitely don't feel bad saying this movie was a bad movie. Everyone. Yeah. It's exactly. fine. Everyone's can cry into their money if they want to. Mm-hmm. But it really was a tough movie to sit through. Right. And in fact, I didn't. No, I kind of, <laughs> I paused it a couple times just because it was, it was a t- tough, tough to movie. It I love, Br- Brett Ratner, I think, is a, as a, he's, you he's know. a good commercial director. Yeah. He's, he's, he's okay. He's good. He's better than McG. Jackie Chan is fantastic. Legendary dude. Oscar winning um, person who's going to leave an impact in martial arts and, you know, film just and just martial arts cinema in general. Yeah, yeah, in general. Chris Tucker still on the fence. I don't know. What <laughs> from every story I've heard, it seems as though he would like money. Right. Yeah. He's he's for every he's talented. Thing. I'm yeah. not saying like he's not. He's just his priorities are kind of in the wrong place. Yeah. Sort of. Yeah. And uh but everything else about this movie was just a hot mess. Mm-hmm. Ridiculous. It was cringe worthy. It had a l- so much that were so much that was and and it felt like it had potential somewhat. Yeah, at I remember some the, that casino. Mm-hmm. They were in a casino at one point playing something, and that could have been cool. That's Rush Hour Two. No, that never happens. This movie too. Remember, he's fighting that girl, and it sounds like they're having sex. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you're talking about. And I was like, that, oh yeah, that, yeah, that's true. That's something I've seen. I've seen it before. We saw yeah. it in Transformers the last yeah. night, but it, you know. But it's funnier in this one. Yeah, like they, they they cut back to Chris Tucker just like. Yeah. Right, tear that ass up. He's and that like, was yeah. that was like, whoa, there's something. And then it smash cuts to something just it's I think it's it, totally it dumb. Smash cuts to them being covered in poop or oh, something. Oh and shit, and yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Oh boy. And then the a, a dog pees on him and he says, Hell no. And then the girl doesn't understand because she's like French and, and then, stuff. It's just that's it's it. really like weird. These, yeah. Uh, it's just these weird, weird, weird Weird decisions. Decisions really yeah. going on in this movie. I don't know who to blame, but I can blame, blame someone. Brett so. Ratner. I, I, I'll my, blame, my, blame, blame you, Ratner. Yeah, open invite. But I, I would say don't watch this movie. <laughs> I don't think you gain anything. It's Watch Rush Hour 2 and if and just say it ended there. There you go, yeah. Right? I, I will uh, <laughs> agree with that sentiment. I do not recommend this movie to people. Um, if you're, I don't know, if you're that hardcore of a Rush Hour fan, if you are, then yeah, go watch it on cable, TNT. Yeah. Um, but yeah, don't pick up Rush Hour 1 and 2. And just have a good time f- with those two, and then that's it. Yeah, this it's, it's a tough movie. Yeah, super tough. It's tough, 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 tough. John, tough. do you have anything to plug? Um, Fam Films, uh, the Fam Films Movie Club podcast for Sticker Fridge just had their season finale. Um, Ooh. you should go listen to that. I'm on that episode. The was it good? Was Christmas. it good? It was good. Our season of spiders is now over. No more eight legs. Name, name some of the movies you guys watched. Uh, Nightmare Before Christmas, The Mist, Spider Man Homecoming. Um, um, enemy, like you know, by uh, Dennis Villanueva. Yeah, uh, those are some of the movies that we watched, and that's nice. pretty awesome for that uh, podcast. Um, season two is up right now. Season two of Director Showdown should be coming up pretty soon. Uh, obviously go, uh, go listen to the Sitting Room. Go uh to Revenge of the Sequel dot com if you still want to write for us. Just let us know. Let us know. Yeah. Uh, email us. Yeah, and just um. Keep on the lookout for some exciting stuff pretty soon. Keep the, on the lookout. Yeah, the hundredth episode is coming up pretty it's soon. It's gonna be a good time. It's gonna be great. We're uh, gonna give in. we're gonna give something really cool away for our one hundredth episode. Mm-hmm. And uh, I just want to let you guys know: make sure to review the podcast. If even just one percent of you guys review the podcast, we would be in, in good shape. Mm-hmm. When, you rev- when you when you review it, if you write a review, we we jump up on the charts that's how people find us new new listeners and you even get a mention on the podcast too yeah like yeah we, yeah we review it it really helps you can find us anywhere depending anywhere on you what listen. your review is we'll we'll talk good or bad yeah it, it we depends. could just discourage you yeah exactly so much totally yeah oh i hate you so much all of you people fucking shit i'm just kidding, no, I'm just kidding. close those forums and eh? <laughs> close the comment section close the forums <laughs> But, uh, yeah, guys, thank you guys so much. It means a lot that we are so close to 100, and it's only getting better from Mm -hmm. here. Well, we'll see you guys next week. Later, guys. I love you.